Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> Welcome back. I want to talk about RNA directed RNA synthesis. And that means RNA synthesis carried out by RNA viruses, which of course uh, is carried out by a viral enzyme because cells do not have such enzymes. And just to put this in perspective, I want to give you a little history of uh, RNA. Tobacco mosaic virus was first crystallized in 1935. Remember, that was the first virus discovered at the end of the 1800s. And so a lot of people began to work on it as a model system. It was easy to grow a lot of it. So 1935, crystals were grown by Wendell Stanley. And um, in 1930, at the time, we couldn't solve structures by x-ray crystallography. They were too big. We didn't have the computational power. That came later. But in 1936, those crystals were found to contain about 5% RNA, and no one at the time knew what that meant. What was the RNA doing there? In 1944, DNA, of course, was shown to be the genetic material using bacteria as an experimental system. 1952 was the Hershey Chase experiment, which we talked about showing that DNA is the genetic material of a bacteriophage. 1953, structure of DNA, and Vincent Racaniello was born <laughs> on the second day of that year. 1956, uh, tobacco mosaic virus nucleic acid was shown to be infectious. And that was the first time that genetic material show, was shown to could be RNA. By the end of the 50s, RNA was found in many animal viruses. Uh, and then that really initiated the, the field of studying how RNA is made in infected cells. So today we are going to talk about a select group of RNA viruses. Here is the Baltimore scheme, of course, with our mRNA at the center. Uh, the, the viruses in red we're going to talk about today. So we're going to talk about viruses with plus strand RNA genomes. We're going to talk about viruses with minus strand RNA genomes and viruses with double-stranded RNA genomes. We're going to talk about how RNA synthesis occurs and we're going to focus on what happens in infected cells. In particular, is there a difference between mRNA synthesis and genome RNA synthesis? Now you'll notice there is one other virus on this slide with an RNA genome. That's the, the group six, the plus RNA viruses that go through a DNA intermediate. They utilize, they employ a reverse transcriptase enzyme, which is quite unique. So that, we'll talk about that in a lecture of its own. Now I said that at the end of the 50s, people started working on RNA viruses. And in fact, this was one of the first experiments done. This was done by David Baltimore. So as a graduate student at Rockefeller University, this is the Baltimore of the Baltimore scheme, he was interested in how RNA viruses replicated. And he studied uh, first a virus, a, a plus-stranded RNA a virus of mice called Mengovirus. And then he said, you know, this this is not an important virus. It doesn't infect people. And he switched to polio virus and did a lot of work with that. So here's an experiment where he's saying, what is the enzyme that is duplicating this viral RNA? For a long time, it was thought that it would be copied by cellular enzymes. But eventually, it was shown not to be. So in this experiment, they take polio virus, and they infect cells. This is a cell. It's not a fried egg. It's a cell. And then, at different times after infection, they make an extract from the cells. And they add labeled uh, nucleotides. And they measure RNA synthesis after an incubation period. And the results of the experiment are shown on the graph on the right. So this is RNA polymerase activity in these extracts from infected cells. And see hours post-infection on the x-axis. And then uh, two y-axes, one on the left, RNA polymerase activity. And this is basically the amount of radioactivity per milligram of protein. And on the uh, right-hand y-axis is poliovirus PFU per mil in the red lines. So he split each sample and measured PFU per mil in RNA synthesis. And what he saw was that there was a, a bit of a, a 
period where he didn't see any infectious virus produced, uh, or eclipse period, if you will. Uh, and also, there's very little RNA produced. And then, uh, between two and three hours, a burst in the production of virus and an increase in the viral RNA synthesis. And eventually, uh, these both peak. So this was one of the first demonstrations that there is an enzyme induced in infected cells that can copy the genome because you're measuring copying of the viral genome that you infected the cells with by incorporation of these triphosphates into cells, into RNA product. Now, this experiment was also done using inhibitors of cellular polymerases, drugs that inhibit cellular polymerases, and none of them inhibited viral RNA synthesis in this kind of an assay. And so that was the first indication that, in fact, this geno these genomes, these viral RNA genomes, are copied by viral enzymes and not cellular enzymes. So those enzymes were found in cells infected with plus strand RNA viruses. And David Baltimore then said, well, what about in a negative strand RNA virus where the negative RNA can't go, can't be translated in the cell. The cell doesn't have a polymerase to copy it, so the enzyme must be in the particle. So in fact, he did enzyme assays, RNA polymerase assays with vesicular stomatitis virus particles, and he found in the particle RNA polymerase activity using a similar assay to what I've just shown you, no cells involved, just particles. So he found that the polymerase was in the particle of negative strand RNA viruses. And that got him to think about unifying all the viruses into the Baltimore scheme. Those kinds of findings said, ah, I can kind of trace now how these viruses get to uh, mRNA. Now, uh, subsequently, when we became able to sequence entire viral genomes starting in the 1980s, we began to see that RNA polymerases had signature sequences that would tell you this could be an RNA polymerase. One of them is a sequence of three amino acids, gliasp asp in the polymerase, which as you'll see in a bit is, the, is part of the active site of the polymerase. So people would sequence genomes, say, ah, this looks like a polymerase. Then they would take the gene and put it in a plasmid, put it in a cell, and show that you could make a protein that had polymerase activity. And then finally, when we were able to make enough of these proteins, people started solving crystal structures of these polymerases, typically by X-ray crystallography. And now we have hundreds and hundreds of structures of viral RNA polymerases. So there's some general rules here that I want to review. Much of this you know, I think, from what we've talked about already. But let's talk about the relationship between RNA and RNA polymerase in the virus particle. So we have minus strand RNA genomes. These have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, RDRP, in the particle. And the RNA is coated with protein. And we call that a nucleocapsid. Of course, these, these envelope viruses have nucleocapsids because the genome protein is a substructure within the envelope. The plus strand RNA genomes, they don't have RNA polymerase, RDRP, within the particle. And that's because the plus strand RNA, when it comes in the cell, can be immediately translated. And the RNAs are naked. They are not coated with protein, so these are not nucleocapsids. Now, uh, you can see here poliovirus, of course, on the left. It's just a protein shell with a naked RNA in it. Flaviviruses have an envelope with a naked RNA in it. So the, the RNA is naked because it doesn't need to undergo RNA synthesis when it comes in the cell. And in contrast, the negative strand RNA viruses, those genomes have to be copied into mRNAs, so they need to be coated with protein. Of course, there are exceptions for these plus-stranded genomes. I show two of them here. Uh, the third virus from the left is a coronavirus, which we haven't mentioned yet. We will encounter just a bit in this course. But these are viruses with the longest RNA genomes that we know of, up to 40,000 bases of RNA. And these RNAs are coated with protein in the particle. And they don't have an RNA polymerase. So the plus-stranded 
paradigm so far is okay, but they are coated with protein, but there's no RNA polymerase. How again does the plus strand replicate its genome? How does the plus strand replicate its genome? Well, the RNA polymerase is encoded in the genome, and it's going to be translated when the plus strand gets into cells. We'll see, we'll see some schemes of that today. So the coronaviruses have no RNA polymerase. Why they are coated in protein is not clear. It could be that they're so big and the protein protects the RNA. You know, the other RNA viruses are much smaller. We just don't know. And finally, the retroviruses have plus-stranded RNA. They are coated, those RNAs are present as nucleocapsids. They're coated in protein. And there's, an, there's a reverse transcriptase in the particle. And that is because these genomes, even though they're plus-stranded, do not leave the particle. When it gets into the cell, they remain in a particle and they are reverse transcribed to DNA. So those are the two exception, exceptions that you're going to have to remember, and we'll talk about retroviruses separately. And then finally, we have double-stranded RNA genomes. And as I told you a while ago, double-stranded RNA can't be translated by ribosomes because it's in, in a double strand. The, the ribosomes can't access the plus strand. So there has to be an RNA polymerase in these particles, uh, but the RNA is naked. It's not coated in protein. So let's talk a little bit about nucleocapsids. These, these elusive structures that confuse you. RNA, a nucleocapsid is an RNA protein complex that's a substructure in a virus particle. And here are a couple of different nucleocapsids. Uh, the first on the left is the nucleocapsid of vesicular stomatitis virus. This is the negative stranded RNA virus, so the polymerase is in the particle. The nucleocapsid consists of uh, a single nucleocapsid protein. So on the bottom, they're shown as the uh, purple spheres, if you will. Remember, the, these are arranged with helical symmetry. They are, all these nucleocapsids interact with each other and with the RNA. On the top is a set of, of these nucleocapsid proteins bound to an RNA. And the structures of these have been solved, so you can see the Nucleocapsid protein has an N and a C terminal lobe, and the RNA fits into a groove in the middle between the two. And uh, of course, here there, there are a number of subunits, and to make up the particle, you need many of those. So that's the VSV nucleocapsid. Influenza viruses, th their genome is also a nucleocapsid. It is made with helical symmetry as well. And we know the structures of these. There are eight of those shown at the bottom. Here at the top is a schematic of the RNA, which is the green line, uh, bound to the spheres, which are a nucleocapsid protein. And in the middle is the actual three-dimensional structure uh, of the RNA protein complex. Uh, the flu, the influenza RNP is colored, uh, so the, this is a charge coloring of the protein, and the blue uh, is plus charged. And that makes sense because the negatively charged RNA is binding to the blue regions. And so these are nucleocapsids, and each one is attached to an RNA polymerase, which you can see here. We're going to talk about this in some detail. It's a three subunit RNA polymerase, and it's attached to every nucleocapsid. And when this RNA is uncoated, goes in the nucleus, as we saw last time, that RNA polymerase goes in with it and will begin to make messenger RNAs. And again, it has to do that because these are negative strands and they can't be copied by the cell. So those are nucleocapsids. Now the RNA within these nucleocapsids, or even if it's naked RNA, is always highly structured. It's never just a line. And here are some examples of the structures that you can find in RNAs. We will see these throughout the course. On the left, for example, uh, stem loops. These form when there's complementarity in the sequence up and downstream. And you can get base pairing formed. And then there's always a loop left behind. You can have multi-branched loops. You can have interior loops. You can have bulge loops, all sorts of structures. Uh, and these can interact th through long distances. So for example, these hairpin loops could base pair with another hairpin loop thousands of bases away in the genome. And these structures have functional significance. They're needed for biological activities. Uh, in the middle is an RNA structure called a pseudo-knot, because as the name implies, it looks like a knot, but it's not really a knot in the sense of a piece of string tied into a knot. A pseudo-knot is a stem loop 
where the bases in the loop can base pair with sequences just downstream of the stem. And that's indicated on the top there by those dotted lines. And so effectively what happens is the, the, uh, the loop will base pair with these downstream sequences. The second panel shows you the effect of that. So you have a stem and then the loop is base pairing. So you get a structure folded in on itself and the bottom is, is, is actually the way it looks. Uh, and the top right is the structure of this solved uh, by structural methods. And if you look at this in the right way, it kind of looks like a knot, even though, as I said, the RNA doesn't actually tie into a knot. That's why it's called a pseudonaut. And we'll, we'll encounter these in viral genomes. They happen to be important for various activities involving uh, polymerases. So there, let's now talk a little bit about the rules for RNA synthesis, which is, as far as we can tell, are, are universal. So that's an RNA molecule, of course, which is not drawn in any realistic way because it's just a squiggly line. But let's use that as an example first. Uh, when you copy an RNA genome, you have to copy it from end to end. You don't want to lose any bases. Because if you do, you're going to lose genome sequence, right? That's the problem we have at the ends of our chromosomes. They get shorter and shorter, telomeres, and that, we have to deal with that. Same thing with the viral genome. You have to copy it end to end. And you'll see today that there are some cases where we make messenger RNAs that are not complete copies of viral genomes. And we always have to find out a way to get those sequences back. The other is that the mRNAs have to be produced that can be translated by the cell's ribosomes, of course. We know this already. But these are two essential rules. You have to copy the genome from end to end, and you have to make mRNAs that can be translated. The genome in the mRNA for some viruses is the same thing, and for other viruses it's very different. And today you'll see examples of that. RNA synthesis begins and ends at very specific plates, places on the template. And here in the top is a generic example of a template uh, being copied by an RNA polymerase. And there happens to be a primer there that is initiating synthesis. Uh, these polymerases, in some cases, they can initiate synthesis de novo, which means they don't need a primer. And a cellular DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the enzyme that makes mRNAs in our cells, that is a primer-independent enzyme. It doesn't need any primers. But sometimes the RNA polymerases we'll talk about today do require a primer. It really depends on the virus. Uh, besides the polymerase, you need other proteins. You need viral proteins. You need cellular proteins to carry out RNA synthesis. And uh, these enzymes mostly require a template for most of their work. So we say template-directed uh, incorporation of NTPs. And these are made in a 5 to 3 prime direction, of course. Synthesis is always 5 to 3 prime. But the template is always read in a 3 to 5 prime direction. So these molecules have a directionality imposed by their chemical structures. And that's reflected in uh, making the, pro the product and copying the template. So I said most of the time the, the synthesis is templated which means there's an RNA and the polymerase copies it to make a, a, a faithful copy. There are some examples of non-templated RNA synthesis. We'll see some of those today where bases are added to a product that are not in the original template. There are a couple of very interesting examples of that that um, we may get into later on. So the initiation step shown here, two modes of initiation of RNA synthesis, de novo or primer dependent. Some enzymes don't need a primer and some do. So here at the top, de novo initiation. We have a template, green RNA template. There are a couple of bases at the three prime end shown here is N1 and N2. The enzyme will grab the three prime end, the polymerase, and put down the complementary base to that very three prime base. It doesn't need a primer, it can start at the very end and start copying and start adding bases to the, temp, to the product. Uh, many polymerases require primers. In some cases, they're protein-linked primers. We'll see an example today of a primer that's protein-linked, in, in which case you have a protein on which uh, the, a base is added, one or two bases, and that serves as a primer for RNA synthesis. And sometimes, as you'll see today, the primers are capped. 
cellular mRNAs, and many viral mRNAs have five prime caps on them. This is an inverted base structure, a five to five prime linkage instead of a five to three. It's important for translation, and many uh, viral polymerases require primers that are capped, like this very uh, structure shows here, a cap and a short primer that will be complementary to the template. So that's primer independent or de novo priming and primer dependent priming. The, the way that nucleic acids are made, whether it be RNA or DNA, both have a similar underlying mechanism, which is called the two metal mechanism of polymerase catalysis. And that's shown here. This is using DNA as an example. You can see there are T's instead of U's, but the principle is the same. Uh, here on the right is the template strand with the three prime at the top and the five prime at the bottom. And of course, uh, we have the ribose sugars interspersed with phosphates, with phosphate bonds. And uh, then there are bases, of course, attached to the sugar, which base pair with each other. And here's a product strand being made. We've got the first uh, and the second bases were already added, which of course are complementary to the bases on the template. And here is the addition of the third base in progress. This is a reaction catalyzed by the polymerase. It enables this to happen. You add a triphosphate. So the T that's being added here is coming in as TTP, thymidine triphosphate for DNA or uridine triphosphate. This addition reaction is catalyzed in the active site of the polymerase. And the active site is characterized by having uh, two amino acids, typically ASP-ASP, part of the GDD sequence, that coordinate two magnesium metals, two magnesium ions shown here. And these help to uh, carry out the addition of the base. You can see they are catalyzing the nucleophilic attacks that will remove two of the three phosphates, leave you with one, and join uh, the new T phosphate to the existing A oxygen there. So there's one magnesium, the second magnesium, and uh, you can see aspartate A is holding that first magnesium in place, and aspartate C is holding the second. So that's the two metal mechanism because of those two magnesium metal ions here that are holding the uh, reaction products in place while the um, protein is carrying out the synthesis. The same reaction happens with DNA and with other enzymes involved in nucleic acid uh, polymerization as well. So our first question here is, which is a universal rule about RNA-directed RNA synthesis, A, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer, B, RNA synthesis initiates randomly on the RNA template, C, RNA is synthesized in a three to five prime direction, D, RNA synthesis is always template-directed. Uh, so of course the answer is A, the polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer, everything else is wrong. It doesn't initiate randomly, uh, in one of these previous slides, I said it initiates and terminates at very precise sites on the template. It's not three to five prime synthesis. Copies the template three to five prime, but it synthesizes in a five to three. And it's not always template directed. It's mostly, but sometimes there's non-templated RNA synthesis, as I pointed out in one of the slides. Now, when we were able to sequence polymerases, we found some remarkable relationships. There are four different kinds of nucleic acid polymerase. No more, no less. We have RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which we're talking about today. We have RNA-dependent DNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase, which we'll talk about next week. DNA-dependent DNA polymerase and DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So DNA-DNA replicates our genomes, and DNA-RNA makes mRNAs. And when these were all sequenced, they all have very conserved structures, and the sequences are very similar as well. In fact, these uh, brown bars represent the amino acid sequences of all four of these polymerases. And the conserved regions are shown in colors. You can see there's red marked A, and green mark B, et cetera. 
And so these all have very similar parts as if they arose from a common ancestor. So we had one polymerase many years ago and they diversified into four different ones. The C part is very interesting where the arrow is C in yellow. Uh, that is, that forms, as you'll see in a moment, the catalytic or part of the catalytic site of these enzymes. And that is where you will find some of these conserved motifs like GDD, gliasp asps, which uh, coordinates the magnesium ions that I showed you just before. In other polymerases, the, uh, the, the coordinating amino acids are slightly different. It's just an asp, asp and reverse transcriptase and the polymerases of segmented negative strand viruses and it's gliasp acin in uh, minus strand RNA viruses with, with single genomes. All right, the, the, the exact sequence is not important to you. The key point is that these residues coordinate the magnesium ions. Now we have uh, the most information about RNA polymerases from poliovirus-like viruses. The family name is picornaviruses. And besides poliovirus, many other polymerases in that family have been solved at the structural level. Uh, there are hundreds. So I just want to show you some interesting aspects of the poliovirus structure. So here is the actual three-dimensional structure of the poliovirus RNA polymerase derived by X-ray crystallography. These are relatively small proteins, so they don't lend themselves well to cryo-EM. It's mainly by X-ray crystallography, but uh, it has been easy to do lots of these structures for different viruses. And all of these polymerases, all four classes shown at the bottom, they all have been described as looking like a right hand, which is right there, with uh, fingers and a palm and a thumb domain. And so I've colored it to match the protein. The palm domain is in yellow. In fact, those are the two aspartate residues. I show the so side chains on them. That's where the magnesium ions are held, and that's where catalysis is happening. So that's the palm, or part of the palm. And then the fingers here on the left, there's, people call them um, uh, index, middle, and pinky fingers because they're very specific parts that <laughs> refer to those. And then on the right side is the thumb. And as you'll see in a moment, this analogy, this analogy is good because the palm is where the template is going to go and it kind of cradles the whole reaction in it. So again, when you align these four different kinds of polymerases, and they all look like right hands, um, the, act, the, the, the active site, Part of the active site is here in yellow, these two beta strands, and that's where, for poliovirus, there's the GDD. All right, so that is a ribbon diagram of the polymerase. Let's take another look. These are three different uh, diagrams uh, that I made, which are, uh, show the surface. Now, we filled in the surfaces uh, of the atoms, so you get a better idea of the, of the volume of the polymerase. And so here on the left, we're looking at the top of the polymerase. The thumb domain is here on the right, uh, and the fingers are on the left. You can just see the yellow. Um, sorry, I have now changed the color of the active site to uh, magenta. And so you can see that right down there. And maybe I did put the side chain in of the two asps, but it's very hard to see. So that's the active site. And you can see it's buried in the polymerase. The polymerase kind of cradles around it. And here is a template product nucleic acid going through it. The template goes in the top of the molecule. So that strand, it's, it's colored wrong for RNA, I know that, but I couldn't get the greens to look different enough for you. So there's the product in green, but the template is in cyan, and that's going in through the top. So the template for this polymerase goes in the top of the molecule, and then it hits the active sites and makes a right-hand turn and goes out the front. And I think you can see that in the middle diagram where there is, and we're now looking at the front of the molecule. We can see the product template coming out the front, and the template is going in the top, makes a 90 degree angle, and comes out the front. And so what happens is the template goes in, it passes over those catalytic residues, and the triphosphates are added to them. And of course, the enzyme plays a role in that. By, by res, amino acid residues hold the template in place, they hold the triphosphate in place, and the magnesiums allow the reaction to occur. And the way this occurs is very interesting. All four 
triphosphates go in very quickly when there's a, a template in there and only the right one makes the bond, but it's so fast that you would never notice that. So again, the, the template goes in the top, it it's, passes over the active sites, made double-stranded, then what comes out is a double-stranded product. You can see that in the middle going in. Again, template top coming out in the front. You can see the helix with the, now the product strand is in green. And if you look in the back of the enzyme, that's the view on the right. That's quite interesting. Uh, this is a little hole in the back and that's where the triphosphates go in. So the, you know, the template comes in the top and the triphosphates go in the back and this red thumb or, or, or Protrusion here helps to coordinate uh, the, the triphosphates coming in, and they come in there, and they're right in the active site, and they can then be added to the growing chain. So this is just one of the many polymerase structures that have been solved, but those are some of the basic principles that emerge, that this area where the catalysis occurs is a protected area uh, in the middle of the enzyme, made by this hand folding around it. So that's the polio RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. I want to show you one feature of this that was revealed by the structure, which is really neat, and that is why the enzyme will only use NTPs. It will not put DNTPs into the product. It takes an RNA template and adds an RNA product, makes an RNA product. It will not make a DNA product, and the reason is shown here. This is a structure of UTP bound to the polymerase, and so uh, here, of course, is uh, UTP, Two hydroxyls, TTP would only have one, deoxyribonucleic acid, there's no hydroxyl there. Here's the uh, UTP in the crystal structure of the polymerase. All these chains around it are side chains. This is in the active site here, the two aspartates at the bottom, 328 and 329 in yellow. Those are gonna coordinate the magnesium ions. So this uh, UTP is, is in here, ready to be added to the growing chain. And the neat thing is that a lot, lot of uh, hydrogen bonding is occurring with this UTP and surrounding amino acids. These are various amino acids of the polymerase. And this one in particular is essential. D238 forms a, a, a bond with this two prime hydroxyl. If it's an H, it doesn't form the bond and doesn't sit there in the active site. And that's the reason why the enzyme uses NTPs and not DNTPs because of this, the need to form this two prime OH. In other enzymes, people can change this amino acid and change the ability of the enzyme to add D DNTPs instead of just NTPs. So that's just a, a detailed molecular look, very short of the polymerization. There's a lot more information, but I don't want to uh, give that to you, it would be too much. I want to now look at the bigger picture, the overview, back up and look at what goes on in cells and look at the strategy of polymerization. So we're first starting with plus strand RNA viruses. I showed you the polymerase of poliovirus and the, that is a, a picornavirus shown on the left and we'll first take a look at their gene expression strategies. So these are viruses uh, with plus stranded RNA genomes the, there's another family of viruses very similar to them, the Flavy viruses, and those include West Nile virus, Zika virus, etc. And those viral RNAs are also plus stranded. They happen to have a cap. The polio, the coronavirus RNAs are not capped. These plus stranded RNAs come in the cell. They're translated immediately to make proteins. But at some point, you need to make more genomes, and you do that by making a minus strand a full-length copy of the plus-stranded genome, and then from that you make more plus strands to make new virus particles. So for these viruses, the genome and the mRNA are the same thing. So what's in the particle is the mRNA and the genome, and what's made in cells, whether it be mRNAs or genomes, are exactly the same. They're all full-length copies of the genome, they're plus-stranded, uh, they're mRNAs. We're gonna look at another family of viruses in a moment, which have a slightly different strategy. Those are on the right, but we'll wait for those. Let's take an overview of the infectious cycle to see how the expression works. As I said, the viral genome is mRNA for these viruses. Poliovirus binds the cell receptors. We saw last time the RNA comes out of the capsid during endocytosis, catalyzed by the receptor, 
and then the RNA ends up in the cytoplasm. Now, for every group of viruses we talk about, I want you to think about where the genome needs to go in order to initiate replication. And I'll tell you where that happens for each one. Why don't you remember it? Because I think it's really important to give you a picture of the cycle. For these viruses, the cytoplasm is the destination because these viral genomes are mRNA and the cytoplasm is where the mRNA is going to be translated. We show ribosomes engaging the RNA, proteins are being made, and eventually new virus particles. So some of these proteins are structural proteins that go to build a new particle. Uh, and some of the proteins that are made include the RNA polymerase, which is needed to make more genomes. So the plus strand RNA that comes in is not only translated, but it eventually is copied to make more RNAs. It goes from a plus to a double-stranded RNA. Remember that double strand coming out of the polymerase? And from those, more plus RNAs are made. And eventually, those get encapsulated into new particles, which leave the cell. So these, uh, this RNA synthesis, which is the topic of today, is shown on the right here. It's shown on these vesicles because it takes place on membranous vesicles. We'll, we'll explore this later in another lecture, but for many of these RNA viruses, RNA synthesis doesn't happen just floating around in the cytoplasm. It happens on very specific membrane vesicles that are actually induced by infection. So here's a closer look at the viral genome. It is a plus-stranded RNA again, about 7,400 bases long, not huge. 5' prime end is not capped. There's a little protein linked to the 5' prime end called VPG. It's about 22 amino acids long. The 3' prime end, there's a poly A tail. So except for the cap, it looks very much like a message. And this is also the viral genome. That is the RNA that's in the virus particle. This RNA, the way this is expressed, and this is another aspect of the replication I want you to pay attention to, the way this genome is expressed is as a long protein. We call it a polyprotein. The whole RNA is translated into one polyprotein. And then it is chopped up by viral proteases. And so here's the polyprotein there. And you can see all these cleavage sites, the red and the blue arrowheads. Those are cleavage sites for viral proteinases. And after all the cleavages are done, you get about a dozen viral proteins that you need to make new virus particles. Here's the viral polymerase all the way at the 3' prime end, 3D Paul. That's the name for the RNA polymerase of these viruses. And at the left are all the capsid proteins. And then all the other proteins are needed for some aspect of replication. So we have one messenger RNA. We, that's hard to deal with in a eukaryotic cell. If you want to make a lot of proteins from one message, not a lot of ways you can do that. And so the strategy here is to make a big protein and chop it up. We'll see some other strategies as we go along. Let's talk a little bit about how this genome is replicated. At the very five prime end, remember I told you there is a small protein called VPG, about 22 amino acid proteins. It's covalently linked to the first base in the RNA. And that's shown here. There's VPG, the little orange protein. It's linked. Uh, via this phosphate bond to the first uh, base on the RNA, which happens to be a uridine. And that's the rest of the genome there. There's a very interesting cloverleaf structure, uh, and then the rest of the 7,400 bases later on. As we'll see, this protein is the primer for RNA synthesis. So the poliopolymerase is a primer-dependent enzyme, and its primer is a protein. Here's a backup look at the whole RNA genome again, a different view from before. We have our protein at the 5' prime end, that clover leaf. The rest of the genome, it's polyadenylated. There's a pseudonaut at the 3' prime end. Pseudonaut is thought to be a recognition signal for the polymerase to bind this RNA. Uh, and then in the middle of the genome somewhere, it doesn't have to be in any particular place as a, uh, as a hairpin called the CRE, which stands for cis-acting RNA element. What this does, you'll see in a moment. So that's the poliovirus, picornavirus genome. What's interesting is in infected cells, when the polymerase is made, it only copies this RNA. It does not copy any 
cellular RNA. So what gives the specificity to the polymerase? Well, we think it's these structures, the three prime pseudo knot, the five prime clover leaf, and this Cree element, because the only RNA that gets amplified in cells infected by these viruses is viral RNA. And that makes sense, of course, because it wouldn't be really productive to package cellular RNAs. So the first thing that happens is the VPG has to have two U residues added to it so it can be a primer. And that's the function of that Cree, that double-stranded hairpin that I showed you in the middle of the genome somewhere. That's shown in isolation here. And what happens is the polymerase binds to it. Several molecules of polymerase are shown binding here. And then VPG comes in, and this loop at the top of Cree is actually A-rich. It's a sequence of A's. And so the polymerase simply reads it and adds two U's to the VPG. And it stops. It doesn't add any more. That's the end of the function of the Cree, to make the primer for RNA synthesis. Really, really quite a neat little trick there. All right, so then that serves as a primer for RNA synthesis, which happens, as I said, on membranes. And here's a, a part of a membrane at the upper left to show that. Uh, there is a viral protein called 3AB, which is actually a membrane-bound protein that anchors the entire replication complex to the membrane. So there's the poliovirus genome in green, the cloverleaf, the Cree, and the pseudonaut. And it is at the initiation <coughs> step of RNA synthesis. What happens is um, there are two cellular proteins that are crucial for this. There's one called PCBP, which binds uh, the clover leaf, as you can see here, and another protein called PABP, which is a cellular protein, poly A binding protein, has functions in the cell. It binds the poly A of our messages, but it will also bind the poly A of poliovirus RNA. And when PCBP is bound to the clover leaf, it allows PABP to also bind to the clover leaf, and that effectively circularizes the genome. It brings the three prime end of the genome up to the five prime clover leaf. And apparently this is needed for RNA synthesis because if you change the sequence of the genome to prevent this circularization, it doesn't replicate. So now you have a circularized template, if you will. You have a molecule of polymerase there. And then somehow the, the VPG gets from the Cree to the three prime end of the poly A sequence, VPG, PU, PU, uh, and that serves as the primer. How that happens, we're not sure. But again, the, the polymerase together with VPG, PU starts initiating RNA synthesis on this circularized molecule, and it extends the chain until you get a double-stranded uh, product form. So again, this, this enzyme here, this little U-shaped enzyme, that's the RNA polymerase of poliovirus. It's using VPG as a primer and it's making a double-stranded product as the template threads through that active site in the way that I just showed you. And presumably a similar process allows you to go from this to more plus strands. You, take, you copy the minus strand, which is embedded in this double strand, and make more plus strands. All right, the next question is, which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy? A, the production of subgenomic mRNAs, B, de novo, without a primer, initiation of RNA synthesis. C, circularization of template for initiation of RNA synthesis, or all of the above. So the correct answer is circularization of the template. As I showed you before, the RNA ends have to be brought together. But let's look at the others. Subgenomic mRNAs, no the mRNA is the same as the genome. Remember, you don't make anything shorter. Subgenomic means less than the genome, so that's not right. De novo without a primer is not right because remember I said VPG is the primer for RNA synthesis, VPG, UU. So those are wrong and therefore it can't be uh, all of the above. But go back and have a look at the slides and, and you'll see. VPG, UU is the primer. So VPG starts off just the protein. The polymerase adds two U's to it on the Cree sequence. And then that acts as the primer. The two U's hybridize to two A's on the poly A tail of the template. 
All right, so we looked at this strategy where you have a single plus strand RNA genome. You make a big protein. There's another set of viruses called alpha viruses. We have not encountered these, but we will a bit throughout this course. My favorite is chikungunya virus, uh, which we'll talk about later. These have plus strand RNA genomes. They are uh, naked in the particle. They're enveloped particles. Um, and, but they are not simply translated into a long protein. Uh, when these viruses infect cells, part of the genome is translated, but not all of it. And part of the genome that is translated goes to make the polymerase, which then makes a negative strand copy. And then, from that negative strand is made a subgenomic mRNA. And that is then translated to make more proteins. And eventually you have to make full length copies of this negative strand to make more genomes. And that's shown here. So that is a subgenomic mRNA. It's not an entire copy of the viral genome. So let's look at this in some detail. Here's the replication strategy for these viruses. The viral genome is mRNA, but not all of it is translated, as opposed to the Picorda viruses. These viruses attach to receptors. They, are, they enter by endocytosis, low pH mediates fusion and release of the, the viral genome. Goes in the cytoplasm because it's plus stranded, that's its destination. It's translated, but only part of the mRNA is translated. But what is translated is the RNA polymerase, these proteins labeled NSP1234. That's the RNA polymerase. And that RNA polymerase can make a negative strand copy of the genome. And from that, you can make subgenomic mRNAs, which encode the structural proteins that you need to make new virus particles. So that part of the incoming genome that's translated is only the enzyme, the polymerase. So you need to translate the rest to make structural proteins. And those will eventually give rise to new virus particles. But in the meantime, you have to make more genomes. So the same polymerase can copy those negative strands fully to make plus stranded genomes. So it's a little twist. And you may say, why do you have to do this? Because, well, you can't ask why questions in biology. right? Well, you should say, what's the function of this? And the function is it works. The other strategy works. And so does this. So anything you see works. And often we can't explain. Uh, the purpose of it as compared to a different strategy. So here's a detailed look of this to show you what's going on. Here's the genome, the, the Kelly Green genome. It's got a cap at the 5 prime end, poly A at the 3 prime end. It comes into cell. It's translated to form these blue proteins on the top here, which comprise the RNA polymerase, everything you need to make mRNA. That RNA polymerase can then copy the plus strand into a minus strand. And there's a promoter shown in red there for subgenomic mRNA synthesis. And that subgenomic mRNA gives rise to the structural proteins to build new virus particles. And of course, the subgenomic mRNA cannot be a virus genome. It's not the whole genome. So you have to make a full length genome. To do that, you have to take those negative strands and copy them into full length plus strands. So it's a little Baroque, but. Uh, you know, if I were designing viruses, I certainly wouldn't do this. But nobody asked me when they were, when they were giving out virus genome strategies. It's just a little twist. And I, I want to show you this because, it, first of all, it emphasizes what a subgenomic mRNA is. And then it, it's a plus strand, but it's not the genome. You still have to make the whole genome. So you have to, at some point, say, OK, I've made enough subgenomic mRNAs. Let's now make some genomes so we can make new virus particles. Yes? Is there something that um, signals for the RNA polymerase to be translated and stops the other proteins from being translated the first time the mRNA is into? OK, so uh, what's the signal for only making RNA polymerase? So there's a translational stop codon right there in about middle way of the genome. And the protein just stops, and you can't get past it. So that's the signal. It's a translational stop signal. And then if you want to make these proteins here, the only way you can do it is to make a, a little mRNA with an AUG codon that can be initiated by the ribosomes. So the way I look at it is that initially you need to just make enzyme, because you need to make uh, this RNA, this negative RNA, and you need to make lots of mRNA to make structural proteins. Uh, and then at some point it switches from making this 
to making full length plus strand. And that switch requires a modification of the polymerase. So the polymerase that's first made will not make full length plus strands, will only make mRNAs. You have to have a modification of the polymerase in order to make full length genomes. So this is, a, is the other reason I want to show this because it, talk, it gets you thinking about this need to switch from mRNA synthesis to full length genome synthesis, which is going to be important for our next virus. All right, so those are the plus strand viruses. Next, we're going to talk about a mi some two different minus strand viruses and then a double stranded RNA virus, and that will do it for today. So minus strand viruses, we have those with a single RNA molecule, unimolecular RNA genomes, like VSV, that we've used as our model for those. And then we'll have segmented negative strand RNA viruses, influenza virus. So let's start with VSV. The genome is minus strand, right? It, it cannot be translated, so it's packaged with an RNA polymerase. You can see the RNA polymerase in this diagram, the little yellow uh, structures there in the upper right of the particle. The genome comes in, mRNAs are made. Those are translated into protein. And then at some point you have to make more negative strands for making new particles and you do that through a plus stranded intermediate. So let's see uh, how this works. Here's the strategy of VSV. Again, the genome is not mRNA obviously because it's a minus strand. So that's quite clear. Uh, these particles bind receptors, they're endocytose. The RNA genome is released. This is, a, this is a ribonucleoprotein complex. It's got proteins and the enzyme bound to it. So immediately it can make mRNAs, but the mRNAs are not simply full length copies of the genome. They're actually a number of subgenomic mRNAs. You can see here one, two, three, four. Some of these have more. One negative strand RNA, multiple mRNAs, each gives rise to a protein that has some function in replication, the L protein is the RNA polymerase, of course, that can uh, make more mRNAs or it can replicate the genome through a plus-stranded intermediate. So we take the negative strand, we go to a plus strand, and then to more negative strands. That can be all carried out by the L protein. And some of these proteins are the N protein is the nucleocapsid, which you need to encapsidate these RNAs. Uh, and the others are structural proteins that will go on to form virus particles. So when the genome is not mRNA, like here, there must be a switch from mRNA to genome synthesis. Because initially when you infect, you have mRNAs made. But that's not going to get you new viruses, because those mRNAs are just little pieces of the genome. At some point, you have to switch to making full-length RNA. So that's what I'm talking about, the switch to full-length genome synthesis. Remember, these are bullet-shaped particles where the RNA is encapsulated, RNA end protein complexes arranged in helical structure. This particle brings in with it an RNA polymerase. The, the RNA polymerase proteins there in the lower right. The RNA is a negative strand. When that gets into cells, again, complex with its polymerase, it makes one, two, three, four, five mRNAs, each specifying a different viral protein. And as I said, none of those mRNAs by themselves could be a virus, part, could be a part of a virus because it's not, it's not the entire genome. And remember, we have to always copy the genome from end to end. And this is a very interesting uh, procedure. Here, let's take a look at this RNA synthesis. We have a virus particle enters the cell. The genome is put in the cytoplasm. That's the olive green virus uh, RNA, second from the top. It's attached to a polymerase already. It's sitting there at the three prime end. As soon as it gets in the cell, it starts to make mRNAs. And it makes all of these shown at the top, capped polyadenylated mRNAs, five of them. The mechanism is start, stop, start, stop, start, stop. I'll show you that in a moment. But it doesn't make a long precursor and cleave it. These are translated into proteins. At some point, there's a switch from mRNA synthesis to the synthesis of new genomes. What's the signal? Well, the signal is the nucleocapsid protein. As soon as there's enough nucleocapsid protein synthesized from the N mRNA, it begins to coat 
the newly synthesized mRNAs. And the coding by the end protein signals the polymerase not to stop and make only little mRNAs, but to make the whole genome. So if you can imagine, uh, later in infection, when you have a lot of end protein made, it begins to coat this first mRNA, and it acts as an anti-terminator, that end protein, and allows synthesis of a complete plus strand, which is shown here, third from the top. And that is then copied into a full-length minus strand. So here the switch to away from mRNA synthesis to genome synthesis is this end protein. When it gets to a critical level, it says, okay, we have enough proteins now to make particles, start making genomes. Here's a little closer look at this process. Here's the viral negative strand RNA. At the left end, there's our polymerase starting to copy that first gene. It makes an mRNA of the N protein. It reaches this red intergenic sequence. There's a transcriptional terminator in there. The polymerase stops. The N RNA falls off. And then it starts making the next mRNA. So that's how you get multiple separate mRNAs from the same template. And as I said, the addition of N protein at some point will coat these new plus strands and anti-terminate so that you get one full length plus strand. The polyadenylation step is quite interesting as well. So when we're synthesizing, say, the N mRNA, the polymerase, the round purple circle, reaches the intergenic sequence, which is the same between each of the genes. It's that sequence shown there. And you can see there's a stretch of U, and that U makes the polymerase start to slip. It gets stuck there and just churns out A's until it's put a, one or 200 A's onto the three prime end, and then it falls off the template, and now you have a polyadenylated mRNA. That's a nice example of non-templated RNA synthesis, because you end up with a long poly A tail on the mRNA, 200 or so, which is not encoded uh, in the negative stranded RNA. And so again, you slip, you polyadenylate, the RNA falls off, and then the polymerase initiates the next downstream mRNA. Okay, so that is VSV. You have this one negative strand. You make multiple small mRNAs. And at some point, you have to switch to making full-length plus strands from the mRNAs. And the catalyst for that is the N protein. Here's a similar situation with influenza virus where we have segmented genomes. They're in eight pieces. And we'll look at what happens with each, with one piece as an example. But the principles are the same. And here, again, when the viral genome is not mRNA, there must be a switch. Now, you're probably looking at this and saying, do I have to know that? And you, you don't have to know this, of course. You should understand what's going on. I'm going to try and explain it to you. But it's I know it's impossibly complicated. And it, where do you get the herpes viruses? That would be even worse. But we'll get through it. The virus binds a receptor, internalized, remember, low pH catalyzed fusion, the RNA cytosol, but that's not its destination. The RNA needs to get into the nucleus, goes through the nuclear pore, and that's where the replication occurs to generate mRNAs, which get exported, then they're translated to protein in the cytosol, uh, and some of those are negative strand RNAs go through a full length plus intermediate to make more negative RNAs, those have to get exported and put into virus particles. And so it's a pretty complicated cycle. We'll only look at aspects of this today. So the genome is segmented in the particle. There are eight uh, pieces of RNA shown here. They're all wrapped up in protein, as you can see on the top. Uh, each mRNA is copied by the polymerase as it comes in the cell to form uh, a messenger RNA that's shorter than the negative strand template. So each of these mRNAs is not a full length copy of the RNA template. And each of those mRNAs gives rise to proteins, of course, that are needed for making new virus particles. So let's see how this happens. Here's just one segment. Here's the negative strand genome RNA segment right there. Uh, it, it is, of course, negative stranded. And the viral polymerase comes in with the particle. I showed you early on in this talk uh, a polymerase bound to each segment of RNA. And that polymerase is a primer-dependent enzyme. The primer is a cap piece of host cell RNA. 
So it's got a cap with 12 to 14 bases of host cell RNA. It steals that from the host. Uh, and so the mRNA that's made, you can see it has a little bit of host sequence at the five prime end. It's shown by the olive green color. And then the, it terminates about 20 bases short of the uh, five prime end of the negative strand template. So that's an interesting mRNA. This happens for each segment, of course. It's short of the full length genome. So again, we need a switch from mRNA synthesis to full length genome synthesis. And again, the key is the nucleoprotein. It's kind of the end protein equivalent of VSV. Nucleoprotein is that protein bound to the RNA that makes up the nucleocapsid. When its concentration rises to a certain level, it will start to coat any new plus stranded RNA made, and it will cause the polymerase to go all the way to the five prime end of the template to now make a complete product, a copy of the RNA. That, that product doesn't have a cap primer at its five prime end. You can see it's, it's uh, unprimed. And uh, it's then copied to make a full length minus strand, and this can go into virus particles. The mRNA cannot be a template for the synthesis of new genomes because it's got host sequences at the five prime end, and it's lacking 20 bases from the three prime end. So again, a switch from mRNA synthesis to genome replication. The priming with this cap plus sequences derived from the host cell is shown here. So here we have um, our minus strand RNA. It's the three prime end where uh, mRNA synthesis is gonna begin. Uh, here at the very top in, in brown is, an, is a host mRNA. That's a cap structure, M7G, PPP, M6, A, MPC, et cetera. So that is a capped host mRNA. And it's gonna be cleaved by that red arrowhead there, which is an endonuclease that is found as part of the viral polymerase. So the red arrowhead is an endonuclease that will cleave the host cell mRNA to generate the primer that's needed to prime mRNA synthesis. A, a, new, a brand new antiviral drug was just licensed in the US that inhibits that endonuclease. And so you can use these as targets because these don't exist in the host cell. All right, so that cleavage generates the primer. The primer is used by the viral polymerase to, to prime synthesis of mRNA. That's the bottom step here. Here's the primer in brown derived from the host cell message. It's now priming synthesis of an mRNA. So that's the mRNA down there. That's how this is made. It's by priming using primers stolen from the host cell. All right, what about the other end, polyadenylation? Here's the polymerase of influenza virus. Uh, what we know is that the five prime end uh, of the template is, uh, seems to be attached to the enzyme. The three prime end is threaded through the active site, which is this red oval there with the white one on top of it. As it's threaded through, the mRNA is made. That's the green molecule with the cap. So imagine grabbing this three prime end and pulling it through the active site. And as it moves past the active site, the mRNA is made. Near the five prime end of the, of the viral RNA, the negative strand segment, is a stretch of U's. And when those get through the active site, the template can't move anymore because the five prime end is attached. You can keep tugging on it, but it's not gonna go anywhere. So then the polymerase starts to churn out, it slips, it starts to churn out lots of A's, and that's how it makes a poly A tail very much like the VSV situation, except here the template is anchored and that's why this stuttering occurs. So the result is a message with a cap derived from the host cell and some sequences, 12 to 13 bases, and then it's polyadenylated. So that is the influenza virus scheme for uh, genome and mRNA synthesis. We have another question which is how are influenza virus and VSV RNA synthesis similar? Uh, a, the switch from mRNA to genome RNA is controlled by an RNA binding protein, N protein. B, polyadenylation occurs at a short stretch of U 
residues C viral mRNAs are shorter than minus genome RNA, D, all of the above. Okay, the answer is all of the above. So the switch is controlled by an RNA binding protein, that's correct. Polyadenylation occurs at U residues by slippage, and the mRNAs are shorter than the minus strand genome. All right, the last virus we're going to consider are the double-stranded RNA viruses, where the genome is double-stranded RNA, and this cannot be translated, so it has to be made into a messenger RNA that gets translated into protein, uh, and then to replicate that same messenger RNA just simply made double-stranded, as you will see. So here's the scheme of, uh, of the infection of a cell. The viruses bind receptors. And remember, as they move uh, into the endosome, endosome pH drops, and they fuse with lysosome, and the enzymes start to di digest away the outer shell, and that allows the uh, inner shell to penetrate into the cytosol, and that's the destination. But the cool thing here is that the mRNAs never leave the core of the particle. They never go out, in, the double-stranded RNAs never go out into the cytosol. They remain in the core, which is where the RNA polymerase is, and it makes mRNAs in the core, and they come out of the turrets of this particle. You can see the squiggly mRNAs coming out there. Those mRNAs are made into proteins. <coughs> proteins are used to build new virus particles which encapsulates some of those mRNAs. So here we have a new virus particle with single-stranded mRNAs. That particle also contains the RNA polymerase, so the mRNAs can be made double-stranded, and eventually they can mature uh, and leave the cell as new virus particles. So the viral genome is not mRNA. So I ask, where is the switch to genome synthesis? Well, here, when you uh, encapsulate this particle with mRNAs, then you start making genomes. That's the switch to genome synthesis. So this is unique because the genome never gets out of the capsid, and in the capsid is where the RNA polymerase resides. I think it's the, the strategy, the reason for keeping the double-stranded RNA in the capsid is to shield it from the innate immune response, which would detect it if it were in the cytosol and mount an antiviral response. And I think this evades that very nicely. So there's the virus particle on the left with the two shells. Uh, as this moves to the endosome, the outer proteins are first removed. You can see that middle protein, infectious subviral particle. And then the core has the outer shell removed entirely. That's what penetrates into the cytosol. And that is double-stranded. That core has the polymerase in it. And it makes mRNAs that come out through these turrets at each five-fold axis of symmetry. So here the scheme on the bottom, double-stranded RNAs, each making a single mRNA that gives rise to a variety of proteins needed to make more virus particles. We think that the RNA polymerase is actually anchored below each turret, below each five-fold axis of symmetry. And that's based on this image of a particle, one of these double-stranded RNA virus particles in the act of making mRNA. So this is a cryo-EM study of uh, particles making mRNA. And here on the right, you can see one of the turrets at the five-fold axis. The RNA is snaking through it. So this would be mRNA coming out of the particle. We think the polymerase is just below the turret at each five-fold axis of symmetry. Now, do you, does anyone remember how many five-fold axes of symmetry there are in an icosahedral particle? Thank you. One year, no one knew. <laughs> It's very sad. 12. And in fact, we don't know any double-stranded RNA virus with more than 12 segments. So we think there's one segment per five-fold axis. That's where the polymerase is. The RNA is made right there, and it comes right out through that. We've talked about RNA synthesis in three classes of genomes, plus, minus, and double-stranded RNA. I'd like you to understand the polymerase basics, where RNA synthesis begins, the differentiation between genome replication and mRNA synthesis and the addition of poly A. And for the classes of viruses that we talked about, the plus, the minus strand, and the double-stranded RNA. But when we come back on Monday, we'll talk about transcription, which is something that happens when DNA viruses infect cells.